is your main man, and today we're going to be doing the safety dance. That's right, we're going to be talking about humans with funny hats. Now, this is a term I originally covered way back in the beginning of our role-playing in Advanced Dungeons and Dragons in the 80s. Not sure exactly who said it first, probably Gary Gygax, and I know I've talked with Jordan several times in various uh, posts about that. Now, it basically... Uh, something that goes across many different games. So it's very much applies to Palladium, to Star Wars, as much as it does to Dungeons and Dragons, or to Shadowrun, or really any game that you have a large number of different sort of non-humans that you can play, or even L1. So what that term really means is some people, most people probably, <laughs> have games, I've seen lots and lots of people portray things that are non-human, essentially like they're playing human beings. Like, okay, your character has 20 years, dude, but that's just a human. There's nothing there at all that makes me buy or believe any alien aspect, anything that is non-human about you. You're just a human that's short and squat or has 20 years or whatever. And that was so dominant. I remember back when I started in AD&D 1st Edition uh, and AD&D 2nd Edition when, you know, I granted, of course, in middle school, high school, people don't really learn how to role play, you know, at that point. So, eh, people are playing elves for the massive amount of bonuses that AD&D gave them because they were grossly overbalanced. But I saw human elves all the time. I got the point I utterly hated elves. Utterly hated elves. And I still hate longswords. I won't use them for my characters, period. Just won't. Like, Here's the plus five longsword. That's, you wouldn't take that one, Brady. Uh, I ain't touching it. So, that being said, uh, you got to really bring the flavor, and the way to most easily do that is study the culture. And sadly, the game books, the player's guides, almost universally fail us here. They give you so little cultural detail to go on. And of course, they publish a, you know, a Races of the Wild book or an expanded uh, continent guide for rifts or what have you. And they give you more details on that race. And you could plumb those. You could just look at Wikipedia and start pulling up information from where that race actually came from. You know, let's, let's study actual elves in, in a mythological context and start maybe bringing some more of that in with the character. Particularly if you want to put a slightly different twist on it, you can start off in the same place that those ideas were originally mined and take them and twist them just a little bit so that you still have a throwback point to the genesis of the ideas in what what's helping making you different. Because again, Often you want to play, at least in some part, against types. Now, remember, playing against types doesn't mean you just play a human or you're asking, I'm you know, elf, but I'm really just a dwarf, but I look like an elf. No, no, no. If you're going to play against types, the all the more reason that you have to very, very methodically bring those characteristics of what that kind of race is. And you want to look at those defining characteristics and really build them up, produce your scenes, and make sure that, for example, like an elf, you know, you can bring across the sensitivity to music, the sensitivity to, to bright lights and to sounds, and how that begins to sort of influence the culture, the appreciation of beauty and uh, of a genteel aspect, uh, a tremendous patience from having long lives and of, of being slow to breed, an inability to examine ideas. One of the great keys in a lot of games, they very... Uh, definitively explain humans are the most adaptable. Humans can get to it and make make that twist because humans have that great ability to uh, make those leaps of, uh, those, 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 those intuitive leaps, which a lot of other races just don't have the ability to do. And the reason why humans continue to predominate in many settings because they can make those leaps. So the other races can't. So when you're playing the character, don't make them. You know, if it's right here, and you see it's right here, it doesn't mean you go for it. You go... Hold on. And the dwarf ponders methodically what he wants to do. Think about it like, like an equation. So the human, or us, can just look at the math problem and go, boom, seven is the answer. However, the dwarf takes the math problem and very carefully works it out every degree and variant and angle, and he comes up with a more precise version, a better idea, and an idea that over the long haul will yield a lot less mistakes because... Seven, every once in a while, will not be the right answer to, to, to the math equation when the humans are just, boom, it's this way. But the, the fact the humans are always going to be, or so often going to be there first, 
with so many different things, and that's how you must come to dominate them often in fantasy worlds, where the other races are like, oh, we're, we're catching up, you know, that is, is it a big difference to something to subtract, and creating a larger birth for the aspects of the character trying to get over by pulling things away. So think about what is distinctly human and look at that race and say, okay, which parts of a human can I just sort of uh, pull away to make the aspects of this creature's psychology of its personality stand out all the more different, twisted, alien, not the same, not the bog standard uh, idea and answer that, that you're going to be looking at. And if you do that, you're really going to succeed at role-playing these characters. Um, but yeah, make sure to study the, the cultures and don't be afraid to sort of invent or go on to one of the various things you can find on Google, a translator, get words from a different language, or get words from one of the, you know, English to Dragon or Elven translators. They're out there. You can find them. And you can, you can bring those words in. You can make them up on your own, of course, as well. Just keep them consistent. And you can throw those into when you're speaking in common, trade tongue, or whatever else the game calls human. You can sort of sprinkle a few of those in. They might be religious chants, prayers. They might be family names. They might be cuss words. I had a game I was playing in recently. There were five other players there. And, you know, I basically deduced that none of them spoke Elvin, I was playing an elf, and uh, I just came up with an Elvin word for asshole, basically, you know, uh, chala, and I would, I would keep, I would, he wouldn't bother really with their names much, he would just say, hey, chala, and he was calling them all assholes, because the character um, was, uh, had been enslaved, and it was, it was a whole, whole deal there not to go into, but littering a few words like that in there, and the players were like, you know, I started kind of thinking, well, what's he saying, you know, and I'm like, well, you speak Elvin, and I'm like, oh, well, you speak Elvin? No. At least you don't know. So, you know, that, that can give you a way to bring another little tool, sort of a verbal prop into the game. When you're naming your character, we don't go to one of those old Gygax names, Stone Thunder, uh, Cement Head, or anything like that. You know, make it not sound like it's in English. It's not good. It completely destroys it, you know. Um... You know, I'm, I'm Mark the Elf. No, 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 no. Now, if you really want to be Mark the Elf, though, eh, maybe you spell it differently. You give him this weird, elaborate last name, or you know, you just change, uh, you know, a few things together. You know, for some reason, you say, "Well, I think that would be an Elven name." You can certainly come up with that, but you want to make sure that it's not. Um, I am a bow shooter. Now, your name may well translate into bow shooter, but an Elf isn't going to go around saying what his name is in. Uh, the language of, quite frankly, an inferior race. He's going to have his name in Elven. Now, he may get quite tired of hearing humans butcher the pronunciation of his name and say, okay, uh, yeah, you could call me Bow Shooter. That's fine. That makes sense. And you've already established that, in fact, that's not your name. But, you know, we can understand now uh, very simply that you're also tired of us butchering it, which gives you a great right there. It's like, ooh. That that clicks with people. Like, uh, I don't think your tongue is well formed enough to spell out the syllables of my name. Why don't you just call me Bow Shooter? You know, again with an elf, elves are often uh, haughty and snotty and condescending, which is fine to work into an elf. But you don't want an elf to just be a snotty, condescending human. You want to bring in, you know, those aspects. The fact they sit there like this with their eyes open for four hours and meditate and have noticed everything that's going on, and maybe you know you say something to them one else of camp or something they were doing or you know you bring up in that aspect of understanding beauty and having a completely different uh, relationship with time and with mortality um, having a heart that is lighter than the heavy hearts of other races now I'm leaning in here to read some notes make sure I hit all these points for you guys of course Really make sure you try to understand the culture. Don't just flip through the book and go, oh, this one's cool. Oh, the dwarfs use battle axes. Okay, good good to go. I got a beard, too. No, 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 not enough. Make sure you read the gods of that race. Understand who they worship, how they worship, 
what their manner of interacting with the world in that way is, because those are the real manifestations of, of the race there, their way in which they believe they are going to go off for their final judgment, the way they are going to be preserved in legend and such things. These are very, very important at the core of the race, so it's very important to understand those, and you can bring those in in other ways, particularly if you're playing a humanoid that does not worship, that perhaps worships one of the human gods of the game. That's uh, that, you know that can be a very important way to do that. Think about what kind of food and drink that race likes. Why? Why is their their palate, their taste buds substantially different? That they enjoy this. Like certainly some races, like dwarves, can drink obscene amounts. They can drink things that, quite frankly, humans couldn't. You know, they are going to knock back uh, some serious uh, moonshine that's just going to drive anyone else blind, and they can do that. And it's completely fine because they have a, a different physiology. They are a lot tougher than a human being, and that's a way that that's going to come across. So in the, in the selections, they may very well be the type that eat quite hearty foods, you know, or an elf may only eat a very little bit and even be kind of disgusted by uh, gluttonous aspects, like, oh, you're eating that much? You know, he's over there eating, like, one little chicken leg, and then he's straight. And, you know, the, the Dwarven Barbarian is eating a sumptuous bounty of, of potatoes and mutton legs and it's, you know, they're going everywhere. And they're like, you know, so, you know, there's lots of different ways you can take those subtle, small aspects of role playing and bring in, produce the points of your character. And try to have at least three, at least three very definitive points of, okay, these are not human. I have this emotion on a broader scale. I have this understanding on a broader scale. I have this uh, inborn need of expression on a broader scale, whether it's, you know, uh, gem or stone crafting or if it's music or whatever it is, you know, understanding that on a broader scale, having something that is uh, too going to come across in the game almost is realer. Like it is that aspect of that character is in super high definition whenever an else aspect of that is running around in, in uh, a rabbit ears black and white. You know, it's so different. It's so robust that it stands out with precision, bringing those aspects across to the character. Like, that's really going to make it pop and stand out and people go, oh, yeah, man, that's the guy that can fucking play gnomes. That guy plays gnomes, dummy, and he is really just rocking that big nose. He understands what he's doing. And, you know, you want that. You don't want to uh, be portraying something in, in a way that is uh, less than quality when, with just a little bit of work, you can uh, understand how to bring something from from a point of uh, of quality, having a an artistic expression, and, and really getting the race over, not just you know playing it for a mechanical bonus. And that's never ever ever an acceptable reason for anything. Um, you should never do that. You should always play it for the desire to role play that race to look out through those eyes to see what, what the world looks like, to understand the different prejudices that are coming back to the character and to express the prejudices of that culture upon others. And then through time, how do we change? How do we evolve and dealing with those? How is this character, um, how much rigidity does the character have? How much ability to change is And remember, these races pretty much overall are much less able to change than humans, so it should be a slower progression. It should be different. It should be quite, perhaps almost, when the elf, who's like a 100 years old, sees an entirely different form of government than he's used to, and he doesn't understand how to express himself in this government, in these the, the laws that have come down, in the, uh, the courtliness of it, or, or the lack of, and how different is that from his? How does he react to that? You know, that's great role-playing fodder. Our, in our kingdom, you know, we handle things this way, this way, this way. Well, why isn't it done that way? And that could even be something that gives the character stress and then, you know, bringing that forward in the game. Because, well, why is he? Oh, you know, he, this is not his culture. And again, the light bulb to go off, not a human. And you know, you want those going off. At least here and there. Again, this is not something you want to beat him over the head with like a club. Just subtly produce it, put it, you know, a little bit here in this game session and two game sessions later, a little bit here, a little bit here. And you know, bring it in there subtly, but every once in a while, you know, there are going to be those things that are overt in, in understanding, and when you're playing over a level time and really pushing forth certain emotions or certain aptitudes from that character at a much, like I said, uh, high-definition fashion, 
they're definitely going to pick up on that and, and appreciate it. Uh, you can think about, let's see, what else do I have here? Think about the weapons the race is known for. Now, you know, a great way to flip things around is to play, you know, the, the simplest, easiest one right out of the box. The quickest flip is the elf with the battle axe. Now, I remember seeing someone do it in a game when I was 15. I was like, oh, you know, that's cool. Because he was so sick of people playing elves with longsword. So you got the elf with the battle axe. You know, it's different. Because he's using he's using a cultural weapon. And then you go in a whole backstory just there, boom. And, and when you describe him, my elf, he has this, this uh, one, one-bladed one battle axe. And you're like, oh, one-bladed battle axe for an elf. Oh, that's kind of cool, you know. Or maybe you're a dwarf who's using a pole arm. And, you know, they're like, well, yeah, but my pole is kind of stocky, and it's kind of it's a little bit fatter, you know, and just the blade, you know, you go in your details, like, oh, what a pole arm. You know, I would have thought at first because it's short, but, you know, he's so stocky. Yeah, okay. You know, uh, so you can really start sort of building more off that. I think flipping a weapon is, is a great way to flip. Or if you've gone and you really are trying to play against certain types, you know, you want to make a good Yankee who's like kind of good instead of evil, who, appreci- who begins to appreciate beauty, begins to appreciate people's right to not be enslaved or brutally murdered. Uh, maybe you go, well, yeah, but I still have that two-handed sword. You know, he uses that two-handed sword. He's all about that two-handed sword because that's that's his race. That's what he knows. You know, he still has this brutishness about him. He still has this extremely hard edge. Not a bad person. He just has a very rough exterior. He's trying to find uh, the way to express love, but it comes off. Even dickishly, he's like, I'm trying to be nice to somebody, and he's just sitting there picking apart every little aspect of what they're doing wrong because he's trying to be nice to them. He's like, oh, well, you're doing that wrong and that wrong and that wrong and that wrong, and, you know, he dresses up a little more than that, time constraints, um, explaining those things like, God, that guy's such a dick because it's Yankee or dicks. So it should still come across even if you're a completely good person. You should be a major dick and completely not realize it because, you know, you're going to bring across – those aspects, you know, you still are probably going to think that, well, you're better than, than everyone else. And if you're a good Yankee, maybe you are. So you're bringing that, you know, those, those sort of aspects uh, across in the game. Think about the animals the races are known for, you know. Uh, if you go, oh, yeah, my dwarf has a cat. Like, your dwarf has a cat? Well, that's weird. This guy, maybe I'll think like an elf would have a cat. You're like, no, no, my dwarf has a cat. Maybe everything else is like real dwarfy about him, but he's really all kinds of feminine on this cat. And, he, you know, he has that or... You know, you could bring across an elf that has a bird or something like that to be different. Or you can bring in, you know, the things that people are like, oh, yeah, I would definitely see an elf would have like a fox for an animal companion. Okay, that makes sense to me. And, you know, bring those aspects across. And then also, not only into that, but how does you relate to them? You know, is an elf like, oh, I don't think we should be riding horses. Is a dwarf afraid to ride horses? Because he's, you know, he saw his brother uh, fall off a horse after after completely flipping out on it, falls the horse and get kicked in the head, and his brother is a half now. So he's like, oh, no, I'm afraid of horses. And the same thing can be said with open water. You know, how are these races going to deal with going across a boat? You know, uh, that uh, that can be very um, very interesting. And you know, the dwarf BC just completely freezing up. And this, this fearless guy, that's another great thing, fear, you know, to go into what they're afraid of and never make a character that's just not afraid of anything. Even if you're like a paladin, just be afraid of something. It makes your character so much more awesome. And it makes the not being afraid actually really stand out. If you're just, mm, so many things. Like, okay, Goldberg, why don't you actually sell something? Just just one move. You know, sell one move for me. And then, you know, it's going to make the the badass actually stand out. Where you're like, I don't like this. I'm going to get green. I'm going to puke over the side of the boat. And, then, you know, they can really, you know, uh, be a way to get some more out of that uh, kind of scene and, and additional ways to find selling. You know, I get selling all the time because I think it's something that can be brought up in you know, quite quite a, a few times, quite a few videos. Um, you can think about music, you know, how I really look at elves as a very light musical culture in the majority, for the majority of times, very artistic and finding ways to artistically express themselves. So maybe you have an elf who was raised amongst orcs and he's pretty much, he has a lot of the the culture, you know, we have that nature versus nurture. So his nurture has been crazy orcs who probably have been mad racist to him and whooped his ass a lot. But he somehow managed to stay there and be tough enough to to not just get killed by them. So um, you have this orc culture overlaid with the innards of an, of an elf. So he still has these very fine, fine hearing. He has this um, 
musical aspect to his, his nature. So you have this elf, and he's just like, or percussions. I really look at orcs probably as having a lot of percussion in their music. Wild, savage dances that probably end in lots of sex, like uh, something on a Game of Thrones uh, wedding scene there. I could see that transpiring in Orc Tribe very easily. So you have an elf there, and he's just this masterful drummer, masterful at playing percussions, and some of them not really quite uh, the most kind-looking drum, you know, perhaps savage things that incorporate bones of other creatures, or even skulls or rib cages of other creatures, you know, he's playing these sort of percussions and expressing that artistic talent through that, through that medium. It's not going to be suppressed, it's going to come out in, in whatever way, whatever medium can be found inside that culture to let that voice loose, and that can be another way of, of really bringing it across, you know, ooh, not only does he have this orc stuff on him, but he still has the, at the heart, Elven, but he's not expressing it in the, you know, he's not going to play a flute and shoot a bow. No, 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 dude, your elf raised him on orcs isn't going to do that, but he is at the same time. He's still going to have those same affinities. Maybe he loves spears, you know, to throw spears at people, you know, because uh, he has that fondness for, for hit, hit and move using his dexterity, not getting hit because he doesn't have the, the same sort of hit points as an orc. He's just not, you know, constitution uh, is, is going to be there. That's a genetic thing for him. Um, Look at uh, how do they feel about personal rights? How do they feel about property in that race? And then how, when they're challenged of these concepts that are their home, their race, their tribal beliefs, identities, perhaps even some of them uh, linking back to various parts of what genetically makes up that race, how do they react when they see something completely different? And they can, you can really get a lot out of the character of that in seeing what that is. You know, it gives you great stuff to sell and really kind of pop your game. Uh, yeah, so just really think about that. You know, how they're going to feel with the norms challenged. Think about three real defining characteristics of that race and how you're going to put them over throughout the, the course of the campaign to make the character really stand out. And at that point, you know, you're really doing the safety dance.